Hello, welcome to Dabiston. Today we are providing a critical summary of a best-selling book in an audiobook form. And our book is Robert B. Cialdini's Influence: The Psychology of Persuasion. What does this book discuss? This book focuses on human psychology, marketing, sales, and communication skills. Influence 1984 explains in depth the fundamental principles of persuasion. How do you persuade others to agree? How do others persuade you to conquer? How are you manipulated by smooth sales people, shrewd marketers, and cunning fraud artists? This critical summary will assist you in understanding the psychology underlying their techniques, enabling you to both activate your own persuasive abilities and defend against their manipulation techniques. About the author Robert B. Cialdini, PhD, is professor emeritus of psychology and marketing at Arizona State University. He was also a visiting professor at Stanford University and the University of California, Santa Cruz. Influence is based on 35 years of empirical research on the phenomena of influence, manipulation, and persuasion. Dr. Cialdini also runs a consultancy that teaches and implements the ethical business applications of his research. Introductory remarks what am i gaining you've been manipulated your entire existence now you must discover the secrets of influence for yourself has it occurred again have you ever purchased something you didn't need such as a lava lamp because the salesperson persuaded you to or perhaps you gave to a nebulous cause because you were approached on the street or perhaps you were coerced into a gym membership you didn't want in the first place If so, you have likely been duped by a compliance professional who knows precisely which buttons to press and which strings to draw in order to get you to comply with their demands. The author, Robert B. Cialdini, has been through it all, so you are in luck. He has always felt like a patsy, someone who is too simple to manipulate and trick. Because of this, he has devoted his entire career to understanding why people acquiesce with others' requests. He has conducted several experiments on the topic but has also gathered data through interviewing compliance professionals as well as by observing them ply their craft. How does this benefit you? This summary will describe six fundamental principles of manipulation and the most pertinent persuasion techniques employed by compliance professionals. After reading them, you will not only be able to defend yourself against deception, but you will also be able to employ these techniques if you desire to flex your persuasive muscles. You'll also discover the magic words that allow you to bypass a queue, why you should be wary of people who do you favors without being asked, and how to transform sun devotees into genuine justice fighters. Critical concept 1. Our brain enjoys shortcuts which can be used to manipulate us. The mothers of turkeys are devoted, protective, and nurturing to their offspring. However, a closer inspection reveals that this tenderness is suspended by a single thread. If a chick emanates the distinctive cheep cheep sound, its mother will provide tender care. However, if it does not, the mother will neglect or kill it. The cheep cheep sound is so persuasive that even a replica of the turkey's arch enemy, the polecat, will be cared for by its mother if it cheeps loudly enough. For the mother turkey, the sound is a simple shortcut that enables her to swiftly and in the vast majority of cases, accurately identify her chicks. triggering her maternal instincts we humans like to think of ourselves as intelligent which is why we may find the mother turkey strategy quite naive however we also utilize very comparable psychological shortcuts this is due to the world's complexity which makes it impossible for us to consider the specifics of every decision we make thus we utilize shortcuts which serve us well the majority of the time We are much more willing to do individuals a favor if they give us a reason, any reason, for doing so. In an experiment designed to examine this phenomenon, a researcher asked individuals waiting in queue for a copy machine if she could cut in front of them. She discovered that 94% of people complied with her request if she provided a reason, such as, "May I skip the queue because I'm in a rush?" If she gave no reason, only 60% complied. Fascinatingly, 93% still complied when she provided a nonsensical rationale, such as "May I skip the queue because I need to make copies?" People appear to have a mental shortcut that considers any reason sufficient to grant a favor. Worryingly, just as scientists can convince a turkey to give birth to a stuffed polecat, so-called compliance professionals such as advertisers, 
sales people and con artists can convince us to use our conveniences against our own best interests typically they do this to convince us to concur with their demands such as purchasing a product the commonly abused price indicates quality shortcut is one example this assumption is often at least partially correct but a shrewd salesperson may use it against us for instance did you know that souvenir shops frequently sell unpopular items by increasing their prices rather than lowering them since dealing with the complexities of life necessitates the use of shortcuts we must recognize and defend ourselves against the manipulators who would trick us into using shortcuts incorrectly lest we end up appearing as foolish as the poor mother turkey the following summary will introduce you to six fundamental psychological principles that we use as shortcuts and which can be exploited for persuasion reciprocation scarcity consistency social proof liking and authority critical idea two humans have an overpowering need to return favors has anyone ever given you something on the street like a flower or a free sample of something do waiters at restaurants occasionally bring complimentary sweets along with your bill as innocent as these gestures may seem they are actually relatively simple tricks to influence your behavior you see the first psychological principle of persuasion is the rule of reciprocation we feel obliged to return favors this rule forms the foundation of all societies for it allowed our ancestors to share resources safe in the knowledge that they would be reciprocated later and if someone does us a favor and we do not return it we feel a psychological burden this is partially because as a society we are disdainful of those who do not reciprocate favors we label them as moochers or ingrates and fear being labeled as such ourselves how intense is the desire to reciprocate you ask well it can even be seen in the long term relations between countries consider that in 1985 ethiopia was probably one of the worst off countries in the world ravaged by poverty starvation and disease and yet in that year the country's red cross sent $5000 to aid earthquake victims in mexico city why would this desperately impoverished country send money to another faraway land simple in 1935 when italy had invaded ethiopia mexico had sent aid to the country and this was an opportunity to return the favor in fact People are so keen to rid themselves of the burden of reciprocity that they will often perform much larger favors in return for small ones. For example, in a 1971 study by psychologist Dennis Regan, a researcher, Joe masqueraded as a fellow participant and bought test subjects a 10 cent Coke as an unbidden favor. Later on, it turned out that Joe needed a favor. He was trying to sell as many raffle tickets as possible to win a prize. Would the subjects help him out by buying some? On average, the subjects who had received the unbidden coke reciprocated by purchasing 50 cents worth of tickets, twice the amount compared to if no coke was given. The feeling of indebtedness even seemed to outweigh likability. Some of the participants bought Joe's raffle tickets even though they said they did not like him. Obviously, this was an example of abusing the reciprocity principle because Joe was the only one making truly free choices in the situation. He not only forced a debt onto the subjects by buying them a coke but also chose the method of reciprocation. In the 1970s, the Krishna organization in the United States also used this tactic to great effect. They gifted flowers to passersby on the street and, though generally annoyed, people often made donations to the organization to satisfy their need to reciprocate the gift of the flower. So how can you fight back? As stated earlier, reciprocity plays a fundamental role in the way societies and social relationships work. So you can't forego the principle entirely. But you can learn to identify and resist deliberate attempts to abuse it. Start by getting into the habit of asking yourself if the favors you receive are really genuine or if they could be attempts to manipulate you. Think about whether you actually want to donate your money to that non-profit organization or if you only feel obliged because they handed you a gift on the street. And don't worry about not reciprocating favors that are really manipulation attempts in disguise. Favors warrant favors in return, but tricks do not. Critical idea 3 in negotiations, starting with an outrageous request and retreating from there can win concessions. Just as we desire to pay back favors when we're negotiating with someone and they make a concession, we'll feel obliged to reciprocate it. This is known as the rejection then retreat strategy. 
The author experienced this firsthand when a Boy Scout approached him on the street, wishing to sell him tickets to the annual Boy Scout circus. The author declined to buy the $5 ticket, after which the boy asked if, seeing as how he wasn't buying any tickets, he would at least buy some chocolate bars for a dollar apiece. As a result, the author found himself buying two in order to match the concession the boy made when he retreated to peddling the cheaper wares. What makes rejection then retreat such a powerful persuasion technique is that in addition to evoking our desire to reciprocate concessions, it also benefits from the contrast principle. When two items are presented to us one after the other, the difference of the second to the first is magnified. Thus, the $1 chocolate bar the boy offered seemed disproportionately cheap compared to the more expensive circus ticket. The dynamic is fairly simple to put to use. If you want something specific from a negotiation partner, start with an offer they are pretty sure to reject. Then retreat from your initial offer to what you really want. Your opponent will probably see this as a concession and feel obliged to make a similar one. This strategy is often employed by labor negotiators, who start with extreme positions and then gradually retreat while extracting concessions from the other side. However, researchers have discovered that there's a limit to how extreme your opening position can be, if it's too outrageous, you'll be seen as a bad faith negotiator, and subsequent concessions will not be reciprocated. The rejection then retreat strategy has even brought down precedents, such as in the infamous Watergate scandal. In 1972, the re-election of President Richard Nixon seemed inevitable, yet somehow a man called G. Gordon Liddy managed to convince the committee to re-elect the president, CRP, that they should give him $250,000 to burglarize the offices of the Democratic National Committee. This was a preposterously risky undertaking, but Liddy used the rejection then retreat strategy. He started by suggesting a $1 million scheme involving kidnapping, mugging and prostitution. Though his later second and third proposals were still scandalous and incredibly ill-conceived, the CRP felt they had to give Liddy something for his concessions from his first scheme. Also, compared to the initial outrageous $1 million proposal, the $250,000 scheme involving mere burglary no longer sounded that bad. As you probably know, the burglars were caught and the resulting scandal eventually forced Nixon to resign. Critical idea 4 When opportunities become scarce, we desire them more. For a limited time only. Last chance. Sale ends in two days. There's a reason advertisers often emphasize that a sale won't last forever. According to the scarcity principle, when something is hard to obtain, it makes us more inclined to buy it. We humans see opportunities as more valuable if their availability is limited, and this seems to be because we just plain hate missing out. A 1982 study by one of Cialdini's students showed that when shoppers were told of a limited time sale on meat, they bought three times more than if there was no time limit. Interestingly, this effect was compounded when people were told that only a select few knew about the sale. The scarcity of both the offer and the information itself made shoppers buy six times more meat than customers unaware of either limit. So when does scarcity become a powerful influence on our decision making? Two conditions need to be fulfilled. First, we tend to want something more if its availability has decreased recently than if it has remained steady over time. This is why revolutions tend to happen when living conditions deteriorate sharply rather than when they are consistently low. The sudden drop increases people's desire for something better, so they take to the streets. Second, competition always sets our hearts racing. Whether in auctions, romances or real estate deals, the thought of losing something to a rival often turns us from reluctant to overzealous. This is why, for example, real estate agents often mention to buyers that several other bidders are also interested in a given house, whether true or not. In fact, a competitive situation can induce a feeding frenzy for a scarce good, even among seasoned negotiators. Take the story of Barry Diller, an executive at the TV network ABC, who was considered a mogul for his success in the entertainment industry. But then, in 1973, he paid $3.3 million for the right to show the movie The Poseidon Adventure on TV, once. This was the highest amount ever paid for a one-time showing of a film, and ABC later estimated it would lose a million dollars on this deal. So why on earth did Diller pay this unprecedented amount? Simple. This was the first time the rights were sold to networks in an open bid auction, where the competitors' bids were visible to each other. 
This pushed the buyers into an irrational bidding war, and when the dust settled, ABC's competitors were actually relieved they hadn't won. Meanwhile, Diller grimly stated that ABC would never participate in such an auction again. To counter the eagerness that arises from scarcity, we should always consider whether we want the item in question because of its use to us, for example, its taste or function, or merely because of an irrational wish to possess it. When scarcity is being used against us, the answer will often be the latter. Critical idea 5 Banning something makes it very desirable. You know the old adage that people only want what they can't have? Well, there is some truth to it. Parents, for example, often observe this phenomenon in their children. A toy will immediately become far more attractive if a child is expressly forbidden from playing with it. This effect is prevalent in the adult world too, and it is why censorship is such a double-edged sword. When information is banned, it is perceived as more valuable than if it were freely available. For example, a study conducted in the 1970s at the University of North Carolina showed that when college students were told that a speech opposing co-ed dorms was to be cancelled and banned on campus, they became more sympathetic to the idea, and this without having heard a single word of the speech. Similarly, courtroom research indicates that juries are also influenced by censored information. It has long been known that when juries know that an insurance company will pay the bill, they tend to award larger damages to plaintiffs. Interestingly though, they award even higher damages if they are expressly told by the judge to ignore the fact that the defendant has insurance. The forbidden information seems more relevant to them and makes them overreact, just like a forbidden toy seems immensely desirable to any child. And this applies to other things than information, too. Just consider the example of Dade County, Florida. When it declared laundry detergents containing phosphate to be illegal, not only did residents begin smuggling and hoarding masses of the product, but they also started to see phosphate-based detergents as better than before. This pining for the banished is known as the Romeo and Juliet effect, so named because parents who erect barriers to hinder the romantic relationships of their children often only manage to deepen the lover's attraction. One study of Colorado couples found that when the parents tried to interfere with their relationship, feelings of love and desire for marriage only intensified. And when the interference was lessened, romantic feelings tended to cool off too. Just like the case with scarcity, the Romeo and Juliet effect also stems from the fact that humans really hate losing opportunities. Critical Idea 6 We want to stay true to our word. Imagine you're lying on the beach, enjoying a well-deserved day off. It's a hot day, and you long for a refreshing deep in the water. But what are you going to do with your wallet and keys? Hide them? Or ask a neighboring sun worshipper to keep an eye on them? A study by psychologist Thomas Moriarty shows that asking someone is probably a better idea than you think. His results showed that in general, when people on a beach witnessed a staged theft of a radio from a neighboring towel, only 20% reacted. But if the owner of the towel had first asked people to, please watch my things, 95% of their neighbors became near vigilantes, even chasing down the thief and forcefully grabbing back the radio. Why? Quite simply, we humans have a strong desire for consistency. We wish our actions to be consistent with what we've said. As the study showed, this drive is so strong that it even seems to trump concerns for our own personal safety. This desire for consistency stems mainly from the fact that it makes life easier. We don't need to decide how to respond to each situation we encounter if we can simply be consistent with our earlier decision. This kind of automation helps us navigate our complex world. But what dictates consistency? The answer is simple, commitment. Research shows that once we commit to something with words or actions, we wish to be consistent with that commitment. And public commitment is the most powerful driver of all. For example, after the Korean War, Chinese interrogators got American prisoners of war to collaborate using this tactic. First, they asked them to make very small concessions such as writing and signing innocuous statements like, America is not perfect. But then, when these statements were read publicly across the prison camp, the prisoner was often labeled a collaborator by his compatriots. Astonishingly, the prisoner then started to see himself as a collaborator as well, consequently becoming more helpful to the Chinese interrogators. He effectively adjusted his self-image to be consistent with what he had written down before. 
and having the commitment in writing was also an important element in this process. There is something inescapably powerful about written words signed by oneself. The widely known foot in the door sales technique takes advantage of how even small commitments affect our self-image. The first goal of salespeople is to get prospects to make a small purchase that is not even intended to make a profit. Rather, it constitutes a small commitment that changes the prospect's own perception into one of a customer, making them much more amenable to the larger deal down the line. So the next time a salesperson asks you to buy something, no matter how inexpensive, be careful. Critical idea 7 The harder we have to work to get something, the more we value it. From tribes in Africa to college fraternities in the United States, when a new member is being inducted into a group, initiation rituals commonly involve pain and degradation, sometimes even death. And efforts to curb the brutal practices always meet with dogged resistance. But why is that? Quite simply, the groups engaging in these rituals know that if people go through a lot of trouble to attain something, they tend to value it more. The effort needed to achieve membership makes the members more committed to the group. But, interestingly, groups like college fraternities have also resisted efforts to transform their initiations into some form of community service, like changing bedpans at hospitals. This is simply because they want members to make the inner choice to participate in the degradation and not make excuses like, this was for the good of the community, which would allow them to use an external justification for their behavior. To make the inner choice, they'll need to convince themselves that it's worth it, and this means elevating their view of the group they're joining. Indeed, research has shown that such inner choices are more likely to produce lasting inner change compared to choices made due to external pressure. Compliance professionals like salespeople can use, for example, the lowball trick to try to generate inner change in us. A car dealer might make such an astoundingly cheap offer on a car that we immediately decide to buy it. The dealer knows full well that, during the test drive, we will then independently construct several other reasons to buy the car besides the price, like its good mileage or nice color. At the last minute, the initial great offer is retracted because of a bank error or another flimsy excuse, and we are quoted a more expensive price. Usually, we still end up buying the car because of the reasons we came up with independently. This is yet another facet of our desire for consistency. To defend against this manipulation, simply ask yourself if you'd make the purchase had you known about the true price beforehand. If the answer is no, you should walk away. Critical concept 8 When uncertain, we seek social evidence. Have you ever pondered why laugh tracks are so common in comedies? In fact, research suggests that laugh tracks will cause us to chuckle longer and more frequently, particularly at bad jokes. This is due to the social proof principle, which states that we frequently determine the correct course of action by observing the actions of others. In the case of the laugh track, even synthetic laughter convinces us that others find the jokes humorous, implying that we presumably should as well. This dynamic is also utilized by church ushers, who sold collection receptacles with a few bills prior to the service to give the impression that everyone is contributing. And this is why companies frequently advertise products with phrases such as best-selling or fastest growing, it gives consumers the impression that others are also purchasing the product. When we are uncertain, social proof becomes a particularly potent influence. Consider the 1964 murder of Kitty Genovese, who was fatally stabbed outside her New York apartment block. The young woman's cries for assistance were heard by some neighbors, but no one intervened or called the police. The media soon reported that the neighbors had been callous and entirely unconcerned about their neighbor, sparking outrage. Later, it was discovered that some neighbors had yelled from their windows or contacted the police, but the case is still studied as a prime example of bystander inaction, in which individuals are less likely to assist a victim in an emergency if others are present. Psychologists hypothesize that this bystander effect is primarily attributable to two factors. First, when many people are involved, each individual's sense of personal responsibility is diminished. Perhaps someone else will dial 911? Second, it is frequently difficult to recognize a true emergency, particularly in urban areas. Does the individual sitting on the pavement require medical attention, or has he simply consumed too much alcohol? Is the shriek coming from a murder victim or a football fan at a thrilling game? This uncertainty compels individuals to observe the behavior of others for direction. 
In the Kitty Genovese case, individuals attempted to sneak peeks out their windows, which may have indicated to others that inaction was the best course of action. Suppose you have an emergency in a crowded area. How can assistance be obtained efficiently? The safest course of action is to target a specific member of the group with a clear request for assistance. You, in the green shirt, call an ambulance. This way, the individual cannot avoid responsibility and will not need to seek guidance from others. Consequently, they will almost undoubtedly assist. Critical concept 9 Similar individuals can significantly influence our decisions. As we have seen, people tend to turn to others for behavioral guidance. And this tendency is strongest when the observed person is similar to ourselves, as evidenced by the extent to which adolescents are influenced by the opinions and fashion choices of their peers. Our tendency to imitate others also results in a rather grim statistic. When a suicide is widely reported in the media, the following week the number of people who perish in aeroplane and car accidents increases dramatically. At first glimpse, this phenomenon appears to be rather puzzling. What could account for it? The answer appears to be that after reading about a suicide in the news, some individuals decide to commit suicide in imitation of the victim. Some choose to make their deaths appear incidental for a variety of reasons, and some do so while driving or, terrifyingly, flying. Consequently, there is an increase in mysterious accidents. Sadly, these are not individuals who would have committed suicide regardless. Research indicates that every front-page suicide article results in the deaths of 58 individuals who would have otherwise continued living. This phenomenon is known as the Werther Effect, after the 18th century novel whose protagonist inspired a surge of suicides across Europe. This effect appears to be strongest for people who are similar to the person whose suicide was reported. When young people read that another young person has committed suicide, they are more likely to commit suicide themselves, whereas older people are more likely to react to news of suicides by seniors. In a less tragic setting, this dynamic is also why marketers often use advertisements featuring, mostly fake, interviews with, regular people on the street, who endorse a product. Ordinary people, constitute the largest potential market for any product, and they value a recommendation from a person who appears similar to themselves. To avoid falling for this snare, make a deliberate decision to remain vigilant for such bogus social proof. Usually, it is simple to spot a fake because the dialogue is obviously scripted. And when you do, you should avoid all of the company's products in the future because they deserve to be punished for attempting to manipulate you with fake social evidence. Critical concept 10 We comply with people we like, and some people find it simple to earn our affection. Have you attended a Tupperware party before? Be sure to appreciate the expertise with which the business model leverages the effectiveness of compliance tricks if you decide to visit. From social proof, where each purchase strengthens the perception that similar people are purchasing the product, to reciprocity, where each attendee receives a gift before the buying begins, the concept is masterfully crafted. But perhaps the greatest ruse is that the invitation to the party was not sent by the Tupperware sales representative, but rather by a friend, whom every guest likes. Why is this technique so effective? In general, we are more compliant with individuals we like. In addition to leveraging our existing alliances, as Tupperware does, shrewd compliance professionals also know how to make us like a person. First, they are aware that we are also susceptible to flattery and that we favor individuals who are similar to ourselves. This is the reason why salespeople frequently compliment us and claim some similarity with us. Say, that's a nice tie, and blue is my favorite color too. The physical attractiveness of a person is another factor that influences whether or not we like them. Attractiveness generates the so-called halo effect, in which we tend to perceive attractive individuals as intelligent, kind, and trustworthy. Uncomfortably, we have a tendency to vote for the more attractive candidates in elections. Cooperation towards a common objective, or the perception that two people are on the same team, is an additional factor that has a significant impact on liking. The infamous good cop, bad cop interrogation technique utilizes this factor to great effect. After a suspect is verbally assaulted by the bad cop, the kind and understanding good cop defends the suspect, appearing as a friend and confident, and thus frequently eliciting a confession. The items we associate with a person are crucial to their likability. As an example, meteorologists have received death threats for accurately predicting bad weather simply because they are associated with it. 
On the other hand, if we hear about a topic while consuming delicious food, we tend to associate it with the pleasant emotions elicited by the food. To protect ourselves from manipulation based on our likability, we should consider whether we have developed an unusually strong liking for someone or something in a brief period of time. If so, this may be the result of manipulation. Alarm bells should sound. Critical concept 11 We submit to authority without inquiry, and mere symbols of authority are sufficient to earn our submission. We are taught from infancy to always obey authority figures, whether they are teachers, doctors, or police officers. Unfortunately, this tendency to comply with authority is so strong and ingrained that we do not pause to consider or question perceived authority figures before obeying them. In the 1960s, renowned psychologist Stanley Milgram conducted an experiment demonstrating that volunteers would administer potentially lethal electric shocks if told to do so by an authority figure. Although no one was affected, the results of the experiment surprised the researchers. Or consider the case of a nurse who received written instructions from a doctor, an authority figure, to treat a patient with an earache in his right ear, administer the medicine in our ear. She proceeded to administer the drops to the patient's anus, neither she nor the patient pausing to consider how this would alleviate his earache. Because authority undermines independent thought. And if we lack reliable evidence of another person's authority, we estimate it using symbols of authority. For instance, titles are extremely potent devices that significantly influence our perception of a person. In the presence of, for example, a professor, we not only become more respectful and receptive to their opinions, but we also tend to perceive them as physically taller. Clothes and objects are also potent symbols of authority. In Milgram's experiment, the white lab coat and clipboard of the authority figure persuaded participants to heed them and torture their fellow test subjects. And con artists take full advantage of the power of these symbols by donning uniforms, suits, and even priests' vestments if necessary. Certainly, there are authority figures we should respect, such as justices and certain physicians. But how can we avoid those who exploit our innate propensity to heed authority? Well, awareness of the authority's influence is already a first line of defense. And to readily determine whether an authority figure should be obeyed, we should ask two questions. First, determine whether or not this individual is an actual authority or solely pretending to be one. Are their credentials acceptable for this circumstance? For instance, the actor Robert Young gained notoriety for portraying the title character on the television series Marcus Welby, MD from 1969 to 1976. Even though Young merely portrayed a doctor on television, he became the face of Sanka Coffee in numerous advertisements, which were very successful because people perceived him to be a doctor and an authority figure. Asking him if his credentials for recommending Sanka Coffee were valid would have exposed him as a fake authority. How trustworthy can we expect this authority to be in this circumstance? Have they our or their best interests in mind? A waiter at a restaurant, for instance, may be an authority on the wine list, but he or she also stands to profit by recommending more expensive wines. So there you have it, the techniques experts employ to persuade you. Knowing these six fundamental principles of persuasion, reciprocity, scarcity, consistency, social proof, likability, and authority, will hopefully protect you from their influence. Final result The key message in this critical summary is, in many situations, we humans like to avoid thinking about how we should react by using predictable shortcuts to guide our decisions. Compliance professionals, such as advertisers, con artists, and salespeople, utilize these pre-programmed human responses to elicit responses that are in their best interests, not ours. In particular, they employ the principles of reciprocity, scarcity, consistency, social proof, likability, and authority. Since we cannot cease using these helpful shortcuts, we must instead learn how to defend ourselves against those who exploit them. Do you have feedback? I'd be thrilled to hear your thoughts on my content. Simply write in the comment section about your thoughts regarding content and share your impressions. Also, suggest which book you want us to provide as a critical summary. Thanks, regards, Ali Zaidi, your host from Darbiston.